Hi, thanks for joining us today for our webinar, How Urban Outfitters Improved Mobile Performance Seven Times. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing how Urban Outfitters used our mobile application performance monitoring solution to give their users faster, more reliable apps. We'll cover how they increased work productivity with more uh, stable employee-facing apps. We'll also look at how Urban Outfitters uh, targeted performance issues in their consumer apps. And really, to do that, we're actually going to be joined by a couple guests from Urban Outfitters. Chris Hunter is the mobile engineering manager at Urban Outfitters, and he, he leads a crack team of mobile engineers that develop both these consumer and employee-facing mobile applications. Chris has uh, a, a over 10 years of experience in roles as a software engineer, DevOps, as well as an independent consultant. Now, along with Chris, we have Jason Grandelli. Jason is one of those crack mobile engineers working on Chris's team. He focuses on both iOS and Android development. And um, Chris is going to be leading most of the presentation, but Jason's going to be chiming in on some of the, the technical aspects. So let me give you a quick preview of how we'll be spending the next, uh, oh, about 45 minutes. Uh, oh, and, and so what we'll be talking about is Urban Outfitters and the mobile applications that they have. We'll spend a bit of time talking about development processes. And then Chris will dive into and discuss some of the challenges that made it hard for Urban Outfitters to get the performance that they wanted. So we'll dive into the tools, uh, mobile application performance monitoring that, that Chris's team used, and actually take a look at the specific use cases at Urban Outfitters. And then we'll close out with just a moment. I'll, I'll give you broad brush strokes on what Criticism's mobile uh, APM solution is. And then we'll reserve a bit of time at the end to take some of your questions. So as we're going through this presentation, please put your questions in the chat pod and we'll tackle those at the end of the presentation. Now, at the highest level, before we go too far, I'd like to just spend one minute on who Criticism is. So Criticism provides the world's first mobile application performance monitoring solution. It provides granular data that enables developers, IT ops, product managers, and businesses generally to run faster, better, smarter mobile apps. What makes us unique is we have a massively scalable platform that delivers a real-time global view of, of diagnostics across iOS, Android, Windows Phone, HTML5, and hybrid apps. We are on over 600 million devices, we, and, and we capture over 2 billion transactions daily across the world. So along with Urban Outfitters, there are enterprises like LinkedIn, Yahoo, Home Depot, and Lowe's that are using us uh, to improve their mobile apps performance. Now, um, we are also funded by some of the top VC firms. That includes folks like Google Ventures and Kleiner Perkins. Uh, at the end of the day, what, what this all means is we are really specifically built from the, the ground up to deal with the complexity of mobile, to help companies like Urban Outfitters deliver faster, better, smarter mobile applications. Now, to set a little bit of context around uh, mobile and, and how it's changing the game for companies like Urban Outfitters in terms of how they interact with their customers and their employees, let's just spend a moment looking at, uh, at the market. So what we know is that mobile devices, the, the sales of mobile devices have overtaken PCs, and therefore the time that people spend on those de devices reflects that. So Nielsen reports that 87% of people spend their time using a mobile app rather than a uh, mobile browser. And companies are pri prioritizing investments towards mobile to better engage with these, these customers. So to give you an example, Starbucks reported that they um, have, they've, they've said that 10% of all their revenue in stores is now transacted through a mobile phone, uh, showing that mobile is really driving uh, revenue for Starbucks. From Walmart's perspective, we know that half of their in-store customers have a smartphone close at hand, um, and more importantly, those will, with an app will spend 40% more and, and, and consequently spend double in the store than other customers. Mobile is driving loyalty and retention. And then looking at eBay, they expect to have over $20 billion in mobile-related transactions and payments this year. 
So simply put, mobile is a critical vehicle for driving uh, your company's revenue, customer loyalty, and satisfaction. Um, but in order to do that, your apps must really delight. Uh, they must deliver, right? Um, you're competing for very limited app real estate. The average user has about 41 apps on their, their smartphone. Uh, and if you just look at the Apple App Store, they have about 900,000 apps in their App Store. Um, so you're competing for prime real estate, and it is really critical to be able to deliver on that um, high-performing experience for your customers in order to, to compete for that real estate. So with that as a backdrop, um, let me pass it over to, to Chris. And Chris is going to begin to walk through the Urban Outfitters context, a little bit about Urban Outfitters themselves, and then setting the context of, of their mobile apps and, and how they're approaching those. So Chris, let me hand it over to you to, to begin uh, setting the context of Urban Outfitters and your mobile, uh, your mobile footprint. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Um, so to start, we, we have about 523 locations, I was just told. So we're actually much higher than the 400 that's on this slide. Uh, we represent um, five brands and a couple of incubator brands. So you can see uh, Urban Outfitters being the largest, followed by Anthropology and Free People, Terrain and Beholden. Those are all very different markets. Our age demographic ranges from about 13 to 45, 50 years old, depending on the brand. Um, Urban Outfitters, Anthropology, and Free People are very sort of complementary in the clothing market. Um, you know, we kind of we market to hip clothing, footwear, you know, housewares, and um, you know, uh, landscaping type products. And um, we have about 25,000 employees, which uh, is actually um, a very huge opportunity for us to um, offer our mobile applications to help run a large enterprise of this size. So we have you know these external facing applications that service you know the customer and the brand. And then we have these internal facing applications which allow us to you know streamline different operations within the company. And I'll, I'll mention, uh, I'm, uh, I mentioned to my wife that I was doing this webinar with you guys and she was quite excited. And of course her first comment was, well, how do I get some coupons? <laughs> um, so definitely um, good, good footprint and uh, growing quickly. So more um, already updating the 400. So can I go to the next slide here? Yeah, go ahead. So um, here's just an example of one of the, the latest apps we shipped as a team. My team is actually a very new team. We've typically built applications using uh, third-party consultants, but we've now started to drive a lot of the software engineering in-house to sort of promote quality and um, you know, sort of ownership of these applications. And um, this, the, the My UO screen is the home screen of the 5.0 version of the Urban Outfitters app that we built as an internal team. Um, we shipped that around September 23rd or so. And then it's on the right is an example of uh, the, I believe this is the um, Android application which was shipped a couple of years ago. So you can kind of see the progression in terms of, you know, color and style and, and such. Um, we also have a free people application that's out and uh, that, that application is pretty slick. You should take a look at that. And then possibly going to be doing an, an anthropology app in the next fiscal year. There's other apps too, but I really can't speak to many of them, unfortunately. And can you can you speak just a little bit to some of the capabilities and, and functionalities within the uh, the um, Urban Outfitters app it's, itself? I understand that there might be some, you know, loyalty, social aspects, some music aspects. Yeah. So, about so that? with this version, you know, the, the previous version was primarily a shopping experience with a couple of other uh, sort of ancillary features like. Um, you know the my uh, the UO music feature and stuff like that, but it, primarily it was focused around using the product catalog and you know driving revenue through conversion of shopping. But with this latest version, we kind of wanted to focus more on you know the gamification aspects of it. So you know kind of allowing people to um, you know maybe buy out of a particular catalog uh, or category, I should say, and and you know upon completion of the checkout, you would be rewarded with you know maybe a 10 or 20 percent off on your next purchase, or if you checked in at an Urban Outfitters store and you bought something, you know that's like a two-way kind of challenge. And if you did that, you would get another type of promotion, and then you get badges as well. Like the badges tab on that screen would drive you into like a trophy case, which we, you know we have these sort of, you know they're like trophies for completing different challenges. 
Um, and then, you know, that kind of drives the, the retail experience, you know, make it more than just, you know, your standard uh, three-step checkout kind of flow. Yeah, more of a sort of immersive um, experience yeah. the actual. Yeah, and we're integrating with Twitter and we're integrating with um, Foursquare and we're, we're shipping, um, you know, a new Instagram feature soon as well. Uh, cool. What, what's the Instagram feature? Um, I, 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 I'm not going to disclose that. You'll have to. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Cool. I'll uh, move to the. Yeah, keep going. So some of the internal applications that we we run are the mobile point of sale, which is the MPOS. That's our sort of iPod, um, you know, in-store checkout. So you know, sales associates can check out people. Um, there's the restocking and reticketing applications. Those are more around, you know, bringing application, uh, bringing products onto the store, or you know, managing inventory, or um, you know, managing returns and that kind of stuff. And then there's you know the iPad point of sale, uh, which is this sort of stationary, larger, uh, featured mobile point of sale, which is typically um, only at the kiosk. And then we're working on a couple of new and exciting applications, which you know maybe if we do this next year, I can talk about. <laughs> could you maybe just? Um, I think it would be helpful if you could give the you know the listeners just a, a sense of the day in the life before and and now with these new apps that you're releasing. Like what what were they using before? Um, you know, potentially getting access to these, and and then what kind of devices and what will it look like once they have these in their hands. Well, a lot of this stuff was run by you know your standard sort of inventory guns for different things, uh, for especially like the restocking bits. Um, and then the, the, the point of sale was typically just, you know, like an IBM, you know, kiosk style cash drawer, you know, the IBM, um, you know, Java checkout. So this, this simplifies the setup quite a bit. It also reduces cost quite a bit on each one of those. Um, and, and what device are you guys thinking of using for, for the uh, the store associates once they have the mobile app. Um, for I mean, they already we already have a ton of uh, iPod touches out in the field. That's typically like standard issue equipment for a sales associate. Uh, we're we're going to be tracking for the new iPod Touch soon, and we're trying to get everybody out on iOS 7. So we're trying to get on the latest generation iPod Touch with the um, I forget the name of the company that makes it, but we we have this. Um, scanning cradle, this upgraded scanning cradle that we're moving to. So we're going to be upgrading quite a bit of, uh, of devices in the next coming year. So sort of in, in the new world, a store associate could take this app, they could potentially scan a tag on something and, uh, and, and get a new, t get order additional items or determine if, if it's also in a different color at a different store, just straight from the iPod, essentially. Yeah, I mean, they can also, you know, when when cartons of things come in from you know the truck, they use this to kind of bring them into the inventory. Um, when you know they want to scan like a number of a, a particular SKU out on the floor, they would scan each one and it would give them sort of a count of size and color, and that would sort of drive what needed to come from the stock room to the floor and things like that. Very cool. Cool. So can you maybe talk to us a little bit about the process for how you you do these? Yeah, so we uh, we practice you know agile here, um, although we kind of call it light agile because you know we, we try to stay nimble and and not have like too many meetings. Um, but you know we typical you know uh, Jira ticketing and sprint planning process uh, along with you know a continuous integration and and uh, delivery schedule. Uh, we do we actually some people will take every single dev build that we do. Um, some of the business. Stakeholders will only take the betas before they're shipped, but um, you know we're we're actually using criticism on, you know on every single build that we do, so that when people you know test out something and they experience a crash, we immediately get alerted of um, you know what version that was, so it'll have the build number integrated with the crash report that we get, so we know exactly when it was introduced or the latest version that it's that it's in before it ever goes to a beta, and especially before it goes to production. So. I mean, I could I could probably sit here and talk for 30 minutes about you know, you know what continuous integration is and how we set all that up. But I mean, um, you know, it's pretty standard practice to do that in the software engineering shop at this point. But um, and what's you know. um, just to give the you know folks a sense of how, how what's your cadence like? How frequently are you releasing or make uh, kind of 
pushing stuff out? So um, I'd say we get, I mean, obviously that, that, that's kind of, I mean, it, it can vary quite a bit. It, it, you know, our developers do feature branches for every ticket that we work on. So a developer may be committing on their feature branch for multiple days and like they won't actually, you know, do a pull request into to our dev branch, you know, for a number of days. Or they could be doing really easy tickets and they could be doing multiple tickets a day and produce a build each time. So every time you do a commit into dev, you get a build. So that could be zero times, it could be ten times in a day. It really depends on what they're working on. But we use um, we use test flight to deliver the applications to uh, to our testers and our stakeholders. Got it. Okay. Perfect. So before we used criticism, you know, we were kind of uh, you know a very new team, and you know we didn't have all the, the tooling that we have now. So you know we were we were trying out this restocking pilot, and uh, you know some of the issues we came into were like you know we had no visibility in the crashes. Um, you know, we had no symbolication of crashes, which means that, like, you don't necessarily know where in your code um, that crash originated from without having, like, a DSIM to, to link it up. And then, um, you know, there was no, vis obviously, no visibility into, you know, whether there was a, a correlation to network-related issues. Um, there's obviously no metrics involving, like, you know, quantitatively how many of these crashes we've seen, what percentage of, you know, our overall crash rate was this particular crash. And um, you know, just you're kind of flying blind without any of that stuff. And can you? Uh, there, there may be some folks who, who aren't familiar with um, the sort of symbol location side of things. What does that mean? So, if you see a stack trace without symbol location, it's just it looks like a lot of like memory references, and there's there's really you have you basically have no visibility into where in where in the source that particular crash originated from. You only know kind of like, you know, some of the binary level details, which is not really human readable. Um, with, if you, when you have symbolication, you can actually follow a stack trace using lines in your source code. So you can say, okay, well, in this view controller at line 131, the last thing that executed successfully was this. And then at that, right at that point, that was the last thing you had contact with and you, you crashed. And Jason, do you want to add to, to that? Yeah, I mean, to, to kind of break it down in real layman's terms, the um, symbolication for, for crash details is pretty much just providing um, whatever crash service you're using, even if you're using Xcode to evaluate crashes, with a blueprint of your app. So that way, um, instead of you know, giving memory addresses for, um, for objects, it'll actually tell you the name of the object as you named it in your app. Um, and then it'll also evaluate the individual lines of code. Otherwise, you just get some generic memory references, which, you know, no human I've met understands those. I've met one. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, you can read up on symbolication, but um, for the most part, it just allows a, a human to sort of trace back where that crash sort of originated from, the last point known. Perfect. No, that, that's perfect. I mean, so the, the net of it is it, it, it essentially allows your, you know, development team to translate something that's very machine readable into something that's more human human readable so you can troubleshoot quick, more quickly. Um, and then in terms of, you know, just to put it in sort of the context of your end user, you know, what, what some of this would look like then is, um, you know, if you're using an Urban Outfitters app and it, it blows up, you as a development team didn't essentially have an idea of you know what was causing that on the end user side. Yeah. Was, it, was it a network issue, meaning latencies driving slower performance, or was the app just purely blowing up? That's essentially the challenge you're, you were having. Is that? Yeah, right? I mean, and you can even have you know maybe a network call that you know just completely failed, you know, with a 500 level failure, which you know didn't deliver a certain payload we were expecting, and maybe we weren't handling it correctly, but that caused the app to crash. So, you know, it. it Without this level of visibility and considering they're unmanaged devices, I mean, you're really, you're powerless to do anything. I mean, you, I'll, I'll explain kind of what we did without it, but it, it's tedious at best. So we'll get go a ahead. little bit more into that as we, we move forward, it sounds like. Yeah. So, so we, we did this, this pilot of uh, the restocking app, as I kind of alluded to. And we, we put the app out to a couple of stores in Philadelphia here and kind of saw, 
you know, what the experience was. And we started, you know, it, it, the app worked, but it was, we started getting these reports of, oh, the app keeps crashing in the middle of my job, and, and it was very frustrating. So, you know, we were trying to figure out what to do, so we were, you know, we were trying to dump crash logs off the device and decipher something from those. You know, we were trying to train the testers on, like, you know, to mentally keep track of the steps they use within the application and then sort of report back, you know, I did this, this, and this, and, and kind of giving them a standard Jira type format on, you know, what their test case was for that crash. And now, you know, store associates, you know, you're talking about, you know, pretty young kids essentially, and we're asking them to do this sort of like highly analytical thing, which is probably good for a resume, but it's not really like what they do, right? So, um, it, it, it was it was very tough to, to get what we needed without this tooling. So, um, you know, we, we were we were taking us it was taking us weeks to to fix certain things that should have only taken you know it, it takes so long just to sort of do the archaeology of getting what you needed, where the actual fix only took you know maybe a couple hours. So it, it, it was it was just a, a huge time suck and, and really inaccurate. Yeah, I mean, definitely not a, a sort of professional QA team per se that you're you, you're forced to rely on in a way. No, and and these types of store associates, I mean, they're they're in the field, right? I mean, they're dealing with real data, you know, with, from these web services where you know your QA team, I mean, they they don't necessarily use the app the same way that a store associate would use it in the field. So so a lot of times we ship an app we think is stable, and we don't really know until it's out in the wild. And I'm sure anybody on this you know call who's ever shipped an app into production will tell you that you know, actual users are the best QA you're ever going to get. <laughs> and um, you, even, you know, this was a pilot, but can you give us a sense of kind of what impact an app not working has to story associates? So, you know, imagine this is their problem. I mean, these people, it, you're slowing them down, you know. They get frustrated. They, they don't want to use the application. They don't, they, and not only that, it, it also affects sort of the, uh, or the organization's trust of, um you know, doing this type of thing. Like, you want to instill confidence in, in your, uh, you know, senior management that mobile applications are the future and that they're going to drive business. So when you're having, like, a simple pilot like this falling over, it's, it's not very good. Got it. Yep. So, you know, we, we decided, actually, on that previous slide, we, we, we used the 6% metric there, which we didn't know that until we actually implemented criticism to see, get a view of, you know, sort of as is, how are we doing? Um, and then we, you know, we've shipped another build out and it, it, and it really exposed kind of what was actually happening. It was sort of an epiphany of sorts when you see all that data coming in for the first time. So anyway, so yeah, so you start getting, you know, your, we started using, you know, crash breadcrumbs and we'll talk about that. Um, you, know, you get the symbolic data cra uh, stack traces, crash statistics. You get the upload API and for, for DSIMs, which is a crucial part of our continuous integration flow, so that you can automatically deliver builds without, you know, having a release manager, you know, collating a build and release notes and uploading a DSIM to Criticism and uploading, you know, the um, the binary to test flight along with the DSIM. So you need you need these APIs. That's that's like a key feature for us. Um, you know, and then you have handled exception logging, network monitoring, and then you know these guys are pretty cool. You get to hang out with them at WWDC and have a good time. They give us hoodies. They give us some marshmallow guns that we almost got fired over. And you know, it's uh, it's been a pretty good relationship, I would say. Uh, well, hopefully the marshmallow guns weren't too much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they they hang up in the, on the wall now. They don't use them that much. <laughs> <laughs> Trophies. Yes. So should we talk a little bit about um, the different use usage scenarios that you guys are finding yourselves um, using criticism to help out uh, in terms of your, your mobile performance? Sure. Um, so in this example, uh, one of the, the main scenarios that, that really drives um, our app development here is catching uh, crashes in development. So you know, a lot of times we'll get a you know we'll, we'll do a build on each. Obviously, we do a build on each uh, commit to dev. People start using them, so we have certain people that we deliver that app to. So we'll, you know, maybe the the BA or, or UX, uh, you know, engineers that we have, or 
um, different product owners, you know, they get all the builds and they might try out one or all of them, but and it might even happen on a on a build on the developer's workstation where you know you get you see a crash, every, all the development team is in, immediately alerted of that crash. So you'll kind of go in and you'll check out um, you know what what that was and then you just fix it right there. You don't even wait for it to necessarily go out in a beta or go out in a, in a master build. It's, it's, um, it, that's one of our main use cases, I would say. So you can kind of, you can kind of, well, this, this particular, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, it's fine. Um, so when, when that happens, typically, you know, we would, we would just create a JIRA ticket right from the interface. So that's one of the other integration points with the criticism back end that's useful for us. We use uh, a hosted JIRA um, in Elastian JIRA, and we just go ahead and we create the ticket right from that interface. You don't have to like copy and paste anything. And then you can see here on this slide, this is one of our Agile boards from one of our previous sprints, and you can see that you know the six dev crash is is already there. So um, you yeah, then you can just pick it off and 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 do the work. So this, I mean sort of helps you in a way accelerate the, the discovery and troubleshooting process because it, you know the crash information seems to be percolated through your, your process very quickly. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no lag time. There's there's not a lot of paper pushing at all. You just push one button, it's in the backlog, and then, you know, I'm I'm constantly grooming the, the, the sprint anyway. So, you know, then I'll just it's just in the flow. You know, I go every morning, I take a look at the backlog, I take a look at what's active. And um, you know, if we have bandwidth to take on additional tickets, I'll move it right in. And if not, I'll just put it in the next sprint. But typically, if it's a, if it's a, it's a serious crash or something that is severe, um, you know, it'll get escalated as a blocker. Perfect. Perfect. Should we talk about the uh, the second use case scenario? Go ahead. So handled exceptions. Um, Similar to a try catch, you know, it, it's basically a try catch that gives you some some sort of history of exactly where it happened. So, you know, you may know of like a, a particular area of your code where you know maybe you're relying on a buggy service or something, and you might want to like, you know, wrap that call in, in a try catch that would you know catch a, a certain exception, or you may be like operating on you know a particular object where you, you may get nulls back or something that you know, you may have to handle. And it's good to use this type of handled exception so that you get logging on how often that's happening. And if it becomes sort of this, you know, because that can oftentimes, like, put a user in, a, in an awkward state. You know, you might handle it, but they didn't necessarily get where they wanted to go, or it doesn't look exactly the way it should, which may not crash the application, but it, it, it's still not good. So it's good to put those types of things in a handled exception so that you can see the frequency in which they occur. And then you know, sort of escalate uh, maybe a refactoring or or tell like a, a team that you rely on that the service they're delivering you is, is causing the situation for you, and maybe they should look into their code. And so, it, where the prior use case was very focused on more fatal errors, this is more along the lines of non-fatal errors that you yeah know, yeah you non-fatal is a little more proactive, I guess. I would you know, on, in terms of like you know this might happen, you don't necessarily know how often it will happen. Um, and you kind of use it as a way to prioritize, um, you know, some work you might want to do. And how how are you guys prioritizing um, these? Are there you know impacts to sort of the number of people impacted, or how, how do you think about that? I mean, we kind of look at them and we try to pick off a few, you know, from the list of handled exceptions, you know, in each sprint. So we kind of just go from the top to the bottom based on our availability. Got it. Perfect. So the the third um, scenario, which is more around uh, the monitoring kind of the, the connection of the app to your various internal and external uh, services. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a newer feature, and we've started using it in the last few months. Um, I find that you know this is a pretty useful view to kind of get a view of you know how your network is performing out in the field, and you know, like if you if you do have failing endpoints, um, if they're failing all the time or part of the time, if you have a lot of latency in certain endpoints that might be causing a weird user experience, um, we we found that you know we had a ton of broken image URLs um, on some products, so we were able to use this information to um, you know alert the the e-commerce team of of that. 
um, it just you know it gives you just a snapshot into your to your network traffic and how how it's doing. And it, get, and, it, and it has a nice interface in terms of like you know you can filter by carrier so you can know if like certain carriers are having problems with your network or you can filter by you know a particular endpoint um, and and like which like base endpoint meaning like you know maybe it's it's uh, you know our ATG catalog for instance you know we can we can drill down to all the endpoints from that particular um, domain for instance and what's um you know what kind of um, services are you relying on? I mean, you mentioned earlier your gamification aspects, which are Foursquare and Twitter, but you know some external services and social media type interactions. What are some of the the things that your apps are relying upon, internal and external? Um, so we have obviously you know quite a few custom services which we run internally, and then we um, we also we use ATG as our um, our platform for e-commerce. And then we also, you know, we're integrating with Twitter's uh, APIs. We integrate with um, Foursquare. We integrate with Instagram, um, and we use uh, this, this this vendor called Bunchball. It has this Nitro API for our gamification sort of rules engine. I think, Jason, am I forgetting any? Um, we're introducing um, a couple others. We have a Stores API. It gets us all of our data for all of our stores. It's kind of like all included in internal. Any other external ones? Uh, external? No. Um, other than Foursquare and Twitter and uh, you know coming up to Instagram, uh, future most likely Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Facebook is is one that's on our radar. Got it. No, I appreciate that. I mean, I think that sort of lines up with what we're we're seeing. Uh, you know, it's, the averages tend to be six, seven, eight, kind of different API integrations per, per app, so um, it's definitely, I think you guys are on the, the top end of that spectrum. Cool. Um, and this is just like kind of more filtering here. You can see... You were, you, were, you were mentioning how you would kind of use different drill downs to, to take a look yeah, at Yeah, yeah, like so here's an, an example of like an image URL and like it looks like in this particular example, it's sort of intermittently failing. So, which could be yeah. like you know, maybe you have you know app servers that are out of sync, and you know maybe it'll expose a load balancer kind of related issue. And again, kind of putting in putting in the the context of the end user. I mean, what they would be seeing is um, potentially just an, a blank image on on a screen, and you guys might not have had awareness of that in the past. So it helps kind of. Shine a, shine a microscope on those things that might have been a little blind before. Yeah, I mean that wouldn't that wouldn't trigger you know a crash most likely, and it also most likely wouldn't be a handled exception either. So you know this gives you a nice nice view of that. Great. So the breadcrumbs are a way for us to sort of like what I was explaining earlier when we were trying to you know get the store associates to explain what they're doing. Um, this gives us a way to sort of mark different aspects of the application, like every every view or um, you know different different any, anything that can really be loaded in order. So you can see like the path through the application to the crash. So you can kind of you, you can very easily see well the user you know was at the home and then they went to shopping and then they went to the category and then they went to whatever and then they went to checkout and then it crashed. So you know you can you can use that information to reproduce the crash most likely, and then you know maybe set some breakpoints in the in a, in a snapshot build. Do you want to do you want to talk to it, Jason? Yeah, and what's also really great is um, there's been a few times where we've used it, and it actually it it logs date and time for each um, uh, breadcrumb as well, which is excellent because we noticed that some of our crashes happen if a user was in the app last week. And they were on a particular product view, let's say, and they come back one week later, two weeks later, however many days later, and maybe by that point that product is sold out. But they try to add it to their cart, and we realize that it's crashing because that product was there last week. They were on it in the app, and since the apps are stateless, unlike a website, um, you know, like you know, a website, sorry, stateful, unlike a website, where the website would refresh when they came back, the app won't. So then um, we're seeing crashes. So we're actually able to identify not only 
what happens in what order, but also the time in which it takes for these events to occur. Interesting. So, I mean, it's just sort of, I'm going to try and uh, sort of simplify. Essentially, what is going on is this allows you to follow the user flow surrounding um, some kind of um, crash or poor user experience. It gives you kind of a, a, a trail of what the user was doing to get to that point. Is that So that's essentially how you're using this. Yes, exactly. You know, so we can, it's, it's almost as if we're watching the user use the app. So they, you know, we, we kind of see the steps to reproduce, if you will. Perfect. I, I like that example of the, um, the, the shopping cart. That's exactly the kind of tricky thing you, you know, you wouldn't know. It's a very specific scenario uh, and would become extremely hard to kind of duplicate that um, or even know what was going on. Did, did yeah, you have like, any, like any way of looking at that before? Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say, Josh? Did, did you have a? How would you approximate that in the past, like before criticism? What? What? I mean, are there ways you would have approached that? I mean, not really. You know, it it, it wasn't even it didn't even occur to us that um, products were essentially being sold out while the user's app was in the background, and then they were coming back to it. That never even occurred to us until we saw it, and then we were wondering why these crashes were happening. And I looked at the actual breadcrumbs, and I was like, wait a minute, this this person put this in their cart in September. And it was a sale item, so it's obviously sold out now. I can't even find that product on the web anymore. Yeah. So that's kind of what helped, like, helped us get to that point. Yeah, so you might, you might have handled that in the, the calling view controller that would have opened the product detail and not allowed them to get into that state had the product been sold out when they tried to drive there. But once they were already there, if you open up the app and then you might, you know, say make a network call on, you know, you know, you did show or whatever, and then you would call to get that data again, if you got a null back and you weren't checking for that, the app would crash. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the scenario they would be in. So, I mean, you know, in the context of the end user, you know, we're talking fairly um, technical right now from your perspective, but in the end user, you know, if something like that's happened, how, how do they get the info back to you? How do you know that, that they're their issues occurring? Is it is it through the App Store reviews? Is it through a yeah. Slack channel? How do you guys? Uh, one star app reviews. There you go. Uh, yeah, that was. Well, I mean, we also have a call center, so you know we do get calls when you know we have some maybe like an outage or you know there's some unexpected event that happens to the user. So that that's a typically an expensive form of feedback. And those are also one offs too. So you're gonna. You know, if that happens to a handful of people, we usually won't even hear about that feedback until it comes in at volume. You know, because if yeah. you get one call about that, the call center is not going to call our team and say, hey, we got this one singular call. Um, we'll chalk it up as an anomaly. But, you know, we don't get that until our crash rate spikes, and then it's a great okay, now why is that happening? So we have to wait for enough users to be affected, essentially. And typically yeah. that, that feedback comes on the weekend. So. <laughs> Better to yeah. not have that happen. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, I know. I know some some of the cust some of our, uh, our customers. I don't know if you guys are doing this, but some some folks will actually give um, a, a interface to criticism to the support team so that they can actually potentially reproduce some of the particular issues um, using breadcrumbs or something like that to kind of rewind the issue potentially. But uh, you know, we're, we're, that's the exactly the kind of challenge here is just the lack of lack of visibility um, into these. Cool. Well, um, I, I, let me see. I don't remember if we had another slide. No, we're, I think we transitioned to the benefits. So, yeah. So, I mean, so we went through a four different scenarios of how you guys are using the tool. There are obviously different different ways you can use it, and, and where it, it potentially can help out your your process, um, your development, and de um, ability to sort of uh, deploy these apps. So, can talk to us a little bit about um, you know where it's it's added value for you guys. I mean, we've been talking about it for a while. I mean, it's, it's all these things. So, um, you know, we have much lower crash rates in the application. You know, we're being we we're able to be much more proactive about crashes. It's integrated in our development flow. Um, you know, we uh, you know our our ability to you know deliver more you know more fixes and higher quality code is 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 fundamental. You know, to using the tool. So. Um, you know, and and we have a lot of cool black hoodies that we wear. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, it's kind of you know the previous slides really you know speak for themselves. Yep. So um, 
No, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's uh, just getting a view and how you're you're using the tool, and, and I mean, it's it's an incredibly complicated ecosystem now between the different carriers, the number of different platforms you have to deploy on, um, you know, the different wireless connectivity options a customer has, um, app versions, all of that, and just it you know it leads to an incredibly complicated ecosystem trying to navigate it. Um, so. Um, let me talk. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, I have just a couple slides specific to what uh, you guys have been talking about and, and what our solutions are. Um, and then we'll just take a few minutes to, to look at some of the questions. There have been a few rolling in here. So um, after a couple slides, um, I'm going to take a look at those questions that the, the, list, the folks <clears throat> watching this have, um, mostly for you guys. And then, uh, and then we'll wrap things up. So um, what, what you heard, Chris, and Jason talk a bit about um, is the the platform that they are using from criticism to to help um, monitor and improve the performance of their apps. So there are <clears throat> essentially three three pieces to the mobile application performance monitoring solution that is is, is being used here. So uh, there is a platform underpinning everything that provides a scalable and reliable big data. Uh, compute and storage platform, and that, that runs in the cloud. And then <clears throat> on top of that, we have two components, one that focuses more on the, the fatal non and non-fatal errors around crashes. So this is things <clears throat> around uh, error, error monitoring, reporting, troubleshooting along the lines of app stability and quality. And then we have um, a, a, another aspect that's, that's more aligned around the server and network aspects and carrier aspects of the app, so um, as it relates to cloud and network performance. So those two components are built on the platform, and that's essentially what, what Jason and Chris were talking about uh, in the criticism solution. So we're used by a lot of different uh, uh, customers, including Urban Outfitters, so folks like eBay and PayPal and LinkedIn, um, media folks, uh, Hearst, Yahoo, Netflix, and then you know also Fortune 500. Uh, customers like Home Depot and Nike and Lowe's, all are using criticism in uh, ways similar to, you, to what you heard Chris and, and Jason talking about, both for customer-facing as well as employee-facing app, mobile applications and how you can deliver faster and better and smarter apps along those lines. So um, let me take a look at the, the questions. We'll do a few, few of these um, while we can, so let me take a look at these. Um, Got a, actually a couple compliments on criticism, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, can you talk a little bit about the the network monitoring side of things and, and how that works from an, an iOS perspective? Um, you know, how does that line up against you know information you gather on the device itself versus what you can gather? Um, on on the server side, can you can you guys maybe talk a little bit about that? I mean, it, maybe you need to go into a bit about how your your ops and dev teams are structured. Chris, Jason, could you tackle that? I'm sorry, I, I don't think I quite understood the question. How are we? Sure, let me let me try it, let me try it again. I'm trying to um, sort of um, paraphrase the question here. So essentially, the questions around um, how how do you do network monitoring? Um, from the perspective of the device itself. I mean, I think people are aware that there are two other tools for server-side. So how are you using this in more of the client-side perspective? Um, so we have a couple different server-side uh, monitoring pieces. Um, we don't really, I mean, can't really use criticism for that. Uh, the best we can do is, is use criticism for the in-app stuff. And actually, for some of our in-house services, our app is actually the only thing that consumes those services. So we're really usually the only ones actually looking at it. Um, our, our DevOps team is a lot more concerned with um, our e-com stuff and, and our, you know, our, our larger uh, customer databases. So as long as that's working, um, for them the mobile isn't nearly as important. And that is also probably because we keep a rather close eye on it. So really what we use criticism for, um, we end up actually kind of being the the network monitor for the services, because like I said, no one else here really uses those services except for us and our app. And it's quite easy to integrate with the criticism um, network monitoring. You just basically include it just like you normally would, and you just get it. So there's no special coding for it or anything like that. It just snoops in on your network calls and, you know, 
you get the data. Got it. Um, then there was a question more, I don't know if you guys can answer this, so feel free just to say, you know, we can't take this one, but I'll, 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 I'll throw it out there. So the question was a little bit about, well, what's the difference between your, your mobile app strategies but um, across the different brands? Are, do you have different brands? Uh, are the strategies a little bit different for each of those, whether it's Urban Outfitters or, or Free People or Beholden? Can you give us a second on that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so while they're um, thinking about that, I, I obviously have a, a slide up here. Certainly if you folks have um, questions more specific to criticism itself, um, there's a way to get, get hold of us. So just send us a, a note at sales at criticism and um, we'll certainly try and answer those after the webinar, and then if you're interested in a trial of this service, you can certainly sign up at, at our website. All right, so to answer the one about the strategy, um, you know, the brands have different demographics, so really the, the, the main strategy is to deliver the most unique experience for that demographic, and that's why we have, you know, UX specialists and BAs that really research their particular customer and really know what they should show when, what features are important, you know, prioritizing what we build. But in terms of technology, uh, we try to standardize parts as much as possible. Like, you wouldn't know it, but like, under the covers, you know, like the app that we would deliver for anthropology may use some of the same components, even though you won't see it. You know, it's using some of the same code so that if we do develop a feature that's new for anthropology, you know, we can we can just pull it into the UO code base, and that sort of gives us some some extra velocity. And it also allows uh, the brands to share knowledge too, because um, instead of having each brand have their own uh, technology stack and working on a silo, um, they get to share. Oh, this is how we use criticism to to build our reports. This is how we use this tool. Yeah. So it actually requires a lot less on the mobile team to you know inform and, and train the brand people that are using this because we'll say, hey, how about you know you sit with this person at the other brand who's using it in this unique way and they can share that experience with you. Yeah, so and it's also I guess beyond te technology, it's also methodologies as well. Interesting. It kind of gives you a common language for discussion. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, not specific to the solutions, but uh, kind of any, and again, you know, feel free to, if this isn't something you can answer, feel free to say so, um, but given we're getting near the holiday season, are you guys, you know, thinking differently about things or pre preparations you're making? Does does the tool fit into that in any way? Yeah, I mean, the tool is going to be in there for sure. I mean, we're not taking it out for the holiday. That's for sure. um, but uh, you know, we, we do have a standard code freeze here. So, um, you know, typically we'll do code freeze, you know, before the holiday, you know, shopping season starts, which is coming right up here. Um, it, it may vary by a week or two depending on the product, but um, for the most part, you know, early November, I'd say, we would be the latest we could ship an app. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we kind of code freeze through the rest of the holiday, but we'll, we'll continue to work on new stuff. It just, we won't be able to ship anything to the customer. Um, but, um, you know, we're obviously still monitoring the reports of what's in the field and, and creating tickets and sort of addressing things as we go. I mean, I guess you could make a special exception if there was like a massive, you know, sort of failure that all of a sudden, you know, we're noticing, or maybe there was a back end change that caused us to have to do something. Uh, and do a delivery, but for the most part, no, we, w we wouldn't ship any apps during that time. And at the same time, too, we're using these weeks and a little over a month now uh, leading up to that code freeze to, to really narrow down on our most significant crashes that we're seeing and try to tighten up for one more build to get out there so that way we can, you know, put out the most stable product that we feel comfortable with before shopping season hits. Yeah, we actually did uh, a couple of sales recently which allowed us to simulate some higher volume and, um, you know, sort of zero in on, on the most uh, prominent issues. Awesome. Really appreciate you digging into that. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are a number of other um, folks that, that share your um, <laughs> the, the type of challenge you're up against with the holiday season approaching. <clears throat> 
Well, guys, um, we're we're getting to the top of the hour. So, I, first of all, really wanted to thank both of you for taking the time to share your um, your experience um, and and your knowledge with everyone on the line. Um, it's it's very interesting for for me to hear, and I'm sure folks um, joining us appreciate um, your perspective on that. So, thank you very much. Um, and also, there are a couple of questions that we don't have time to get to. We can, we'll try to reach out to folks separately after the webinar um, with, with the ones that we couldn't get to. So I, I do appreciate everyone taking the time to, to, to send in some questions, and sorry we didn't have enough time to get to them. So with that, certainly, um, like I mentioned, um, uh, we have information on the last slide here, so please feel free to reach out to us or try, try a product trial at criticism.com. And again, Chris, Jason, thank you so much for your time. And for everyone on joining us, I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. All right. Have a good one.